Hey, U.S. History, good to see you guys again. I hope your Easter break was good. I know that I had a great time on mine. I hope you did too. Um, I went fishing and I caught a few fish finally. It's getting warmer, but I tried to go again today. That wasn't a good idea. It was like 20, it was like 30 degrees, felt like 20 something and the wind was blowing and I didn't catch anything. But hopefully the weather will warm up here pretty soon. I hope you guys had a good Easter celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's, it's uh, the foundation of our faith. And so let's never forget that. And um, may we live in resurrection power in our own lives. Okay, so moving on to our lesson, we've been talking about the Great War, World War One, right? Um, you probably remember from last week, what did we talk about? We talked about Woodrow Wilson. We talked about his idea of being a moral leader of the world and influencing everybody, not using force. Um, talked about issues with Mexico and Pancho Villa, issues with the island of Hispaniola. And then we talked about some growing tension with Germany as Europe was plunged into war. Germany was sinking vessels, the Lusitania was sunk, which had some Americans aboard. The Sussex was sank, same thing, some Americans were aboard. So we're already having some tension with Germany and that's where we left off. So today we're going to describe the events that caused the U.S. to declare war on Germany, explain the impact of the war on American society, discuss Wilson's 14 points, and discuss the impact of American in intervention on the outcome of the war. I asked you guys to read chapter 19. I hope that you did that. It'll help you tremendously on everything. And as a side note, I am, you guys have seen your grades by now for your first test since quarter four began. Uh, if you want to do well on the test, do the reading, watch the lectures, and take notes. If you do those things, you'll be fine. If you don't watch the lectures, if you don't read, I can tell you're probably not going to get more than a, a low C if you're lucky. I can usually tell because Google searching last minute is not going to do it. So if you want to do well in this class, watch the lectures, take notes, and do the reading. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so we're already tense with Germany, right? And then this thing happens, and it really pissed us off. <laughs> the Zimmerman telegram. So Germany decides, hmm. America's pretty cozy with our enemies, right, with the allies. So what are we gonna do? I know, let's get Mexico to help us. So they sent this telegram to Mexico. Germany sent the telegram to Mexico, and they said, hey, Mexico, listen, if you help us, should the United States get involved, we'll give you the land of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. It can be all yours again. Just give us a hand. Now the, Greek, um, the British actually intercepted the Zimmerman telegram and forwarded it to us. And we weren't very happy about it, obviously. And it's an interesting thing that, to know about that is it wasn't just like America as a whole was upset. We, I mean, we were, but really the Southwest, the area that was promised to be given to Mexico, actually finally got engaged. They actually started to care about the war because they were sort of their own thing, you know. They were kind of isolated even from American politics for the most part. But now the Southwest wanted to be involved. And so there's a, there's a growing resentment of Germany. And then to put the icing on the cake, and this is an extremely important point to know, if you ever read any books on World War I, it's always gonna spend a lot of time on this, called Unrestricted Submarine Warfare. Basically, the Germans said, screw it, we're just gonna shoot anything that floats <laughs> in war zone waters, and they did. They started to sink anything that they could come in contact with in the war zone, and four American merchant vessels were sank in the process. Remember we talked about last week, Wilson after the Sussex, remember that French vessel was sunk that had Americans aboard? The Sussex Pledge, Wilson said, hey, German, if you sink any more unarmed ships like this, we will cut diplomatic ties and possibly go to war with you. Well, he backed himself into a corner. He put an ultimatum on Germany and then they violated it. So Wilson basically said, well, I guess I have to do it. So he severed diplomatic ties and it was just a matter of time before we declared war on Germany. And that was on April 6th, 1917. And America is now in World War I, the Great War. So how did this affect American society? Now, America had a pretty weak army when the war began. We had about 379,000 men in the army. And we needed to, you know, make it bigger. <laughs> so we eventually did get it to 3.7 million by the end of the war. That's, an almost, that's about a tenfold increase, which is pretty dang impressive, I think. But it's funny because our army was not ready for this. We were ill-prepared. And if you look into, like, the kind of training that these men you know, all these men are now in the army and they're having to be trained, right? They were using broomsticks instead of guns. They were being trained how to ride horses on like barrels. Could you imagine that? Like you're being taught how to ride horseback, right? And you have to get on like a barrel and like, you know, learning how to simulate the, the riding of a horse on like a barrel. And 
<laughs> I just, I don't know. I find that silly, and I don't really know how effective that would really be. But that's what they did. Now you're probably wondering, how did they get that many men to, to join the army? Well, they used the law. The Selective Service Act of 1917, which is basically the draft, said if you're male and you're 21 to 30, you need to register and we may call you into service. They had a lottery system how they did it basically. And in 1918, they actually expanded it from the ages of 18 to 45. The word conscription means drafting. See, sometimes you'll hear people talk about the draft or conscription. It's really the same thing, but it's a way where the government basically uses law to get more people in the army. And by the way, today, the Social Security Act never went away. Sorry, the Selective Service Act never went away. Today, if you're a male in the United States and you're a citizen, you need to register within 30 days uh, after you turn 18 and you basically are eligible to be drafted until you're age 25. So yeah, it's, it's, this, this isn't made up. If you don't do that, then you can possibly face jail time. You can get fined. You can't qualify for any federal aid. There's a lot of stuff the government will do to you if you do not apply, but that is still a law in this country. If this is, of course, a classroom setting, I'd ask this, but do you agree with that or not? Do you think the draft is a good thing? Do you think free nations should use the draft or not? I mean, it's an interesting thing to debate for sure. But it wasn't like the government just forced people into this. You know, it wasn't like everybody was drag kicking and screaming. A lot of people willingly signed up to fight. Propaganda was a really big part of this war and meant pretty much every war. But propaganda, I, I basically looked at a few internet definitions and created my own. A one-sided form of information that intends to sway the audience to a particular view. So in other words, look at this one. This is just one of many examples. You have the American boot, right? It says, help Uncle Sam stamp out the Kaiser. The Kaiser is the head of Germany. And it's just showing like, hey, you need to help your country fight these evil Germans. You don't ever see any, of course, counter arguments in propaganda. You know, the Lusitania, when you have that woman drowning with the baby. Um, you don't hear that, well, they were warned, it was a munition ship, it was a war zone. You don't hear any of that. You just see the woman drowning with the baby in it, and it causes, pulls in your heartstrings and gets you emotionally engaged. I'm going to have you guys do Chapter 9, Activity 3 this week. It's going to be in Google Classroom attached and um, as a file. And I want you guys to express how you feel with certain propaganda pictures. I think it'll be interesting to hear your guys' thoughts on that. But in any case, propaganda was a very big part of the war. Another thing that got affected was food and how people ate and what they ate and when they ate. Um, Herbert Hoover, who eventually would become president in the early 30s, he was the head of what's called the Food Administration. And there is a process he created of organizing and saving food for the war. People called it Hooverizing. And Hooverizing referred to basically things like meatless Mondays. Okay, if you're, you know, to be a patriot, don't eat meat on Mondays. Save that for the troops. And wheatless Wednesdays, you know, again, don't eat wheat on Wednesdays. People would basically not eat as much of certain foods so the soldiers could have those things in the battlefield. Um, you also read about victory gardens. This happened in both world wars where people would grow their, maybe you didn't really garden much before, but now during the war you bought some seeds and you planted your own produce in your backyard um, as a way of, again, letting farms give more money to the soldiers. So, but Hoover was a was a big deal. I mean, he, he did have some pretty smart ideas for how to handle the, um, the need for more food for the soldiers. Wilson, again, doesn't like violence, doesn't like fighting, but even he finally said the world must be made safe for democracy. Um, he basically said, look, I don't want violence, but sometimes violence is needed in order to secure peace. It's funny, you actually fast forward to the 1990s and George H.W. Bush, the dad of George W. Bush, when he was president and we had to go to the Gulf War to fight, he said to secure peace is to prepare for war. And it's the same deal here, that basically we don't really want to fight, but for peace, violence is a necessity. So Wilson's ideals are sort of being challenged there, as you can see. But he did some pretty big steps. The US government took control of all railroads and major industry and they banned private sector competition. Let me give you, let me explain what that means. If you're the government, right? And let's say, for example, you wanna have walkie talkies and, and cell phones for your troops to keep in contact. Let's say Motorola, that's a, that's a private industry company, right? Let's say the government buys their products and only their products then Motorola can get away with charging higher prices and the gov that's called profiteering and the government will pay those prices. If you ever seen the, the movie uh, Independence Day, 
Um, it's probably, it's before your guys' time, but I like it. But in Independence Day, they go to this government facility, and um, Jeff Goldblum's dad goes, what do they charge you? $300 for a hammer? $500 for a toilet seat? And the joke is that they can get people that supply, or businesses that supply goods for the government, get away with hiking up the prices because they have one client, and that client only has one place to buy the thing from. So, so that's why he did that. He said, no, government's going to take control of all industry, and we are not going to compete with the private sector. And another thing he did was he limited the freedom of speech. Man was um, the government said, we're going to basically criminalize you if you say anything against the government or if you say anything against the war. And that was controversial for obvious reasons. And there was a Supreme Court case, Shank versus the U.S. in 1919. And in this case, it was approved. Wilson's actions were deemed constitutional because if something was creating clear and present danger, then that would consider be considered not part of freedom of speech. For example, if you're, if you're in a crowded room and you yell fire, that's not protected by the freedom of speech. Um, there's certain things that are exempt. And I if I'm not mistaken, that actually was cited in 1919. I think it was one of the justices said you can't yell fire in a, uh, in a crowded room. I'd have to double check that. But in any case, the point is that the First Amendment has exceptions, and this is one of them. There were Germans who were infiltrating U.S. industries and trying to cause some issues, you know, trying to, trying to sway the American people, trying to take over certain industries. So there were some serious problems, but still, what do you think? Do you think that the government should be able to limit the freedom of speech in cases like war, where you're, you're afraid of sedition, you're afraid of espionage. Is that a good thing or not? You know, that's, that's a discussion to have for sure. Um, US soldiers were called doughboys. That's just what they were commonly called. Nobody really knows for sure why they were called that. You'll probably read articles that sound confident, but really it's been debated for a long time. Um, my old history book said it was because they, um, what I was taught is that their buttons look like biscuits. Um, our book doesn't. Our book admits in the side margin it doesn't know. It's a, it lists the encyclopedia. I think Britannica has a few ideas. I was just at the World War One Museum and the tour guide. I asked him about this. He said, you know, nobody knows, but the World War One Museum's official. They said the official view, even though they admit we don't really know. But the official view is, when General Pershing was leading Americans after Pancho Villa in the desert, the dust would collect on American uniforms and it would be a white looking dust so it's almost like it looked like dough like they look like dough so they have to wipe that white dust off at the end of the day and he said that that's a popular idea where the, the term doughboy came from but either way they were called doughboys so if you ever poke one of the stomachs maybe that would happen that was really cheesy i'm sorry i'll never do that again okay moving on so wilson again wanting to be the moral leader this is our third objective he talks he wanted to create the 14 points and basically a way to end all war and make everybody happy in the land of unicorns and such. So he created the 14 points. One of those points was about the League of Nations, and which was an idea that nations could come together and settle disputes without fighting. Include in other points talked about freedom of the seas, open diplomacy, um, US led moral leadership, etc, etc. And so it was very high ideals. We'll see if they got anywhere and we'll see if the United States even ended up being part of this so called League of Nations next week. Okay, the last objective, how did American intervention affect the war? So again, we're in war, we declared war on Germany, and now we're sending troops over. July 4th, 1917, the first contingent of American troops lands in Paris. And I forget which one, but an American says, Lafayette, we are here. And you probably remember from the Revolutionary War, Lafayette was a Frenchman who came over to aid the Americans in our war for independence and played a huge role in um, the Battle of Yorktown and other, I mean, he was a big deal and Americans loved the guy. And so we've always talked about having a debt for Lafayette. So Americans are saying, we haven't forgotten you, Lafayette. We're here helping the French. So we got over there. General Pershing, we talked about him. He chased Pancho Villa and never caught him. But General Pershing was also called Blackjack, and he led up the American troops. He was a very big general. I should mention this name, Blackjack. This doesn't get talked about much, but why is he called that? Do you remember my guest speaker came in and he talked about the Buffalo Soldiers? They were black soldiers who fought in World War I. They also fought in the Spanish-American War um, and, of course, beyond that. But General Pershing was a guy who trained black soldiers and he treated them fairly and he treated them with respect if they were good fighters and if they were good, if they were good men. And people didn't like that he treated blacks as equal to whites. So they originally didn't call him Blackjack. They called him the N-word Jack. That was his nickname, was the N-word Jack. Um, and that's what he was called for a long time. He led black soldiers into the uh, Spanish-American War, and the Span and 
and they fought really well. He let them fight alongside white people and it was a big deal. But after that happened, as World War I started, the, the press finally softened up a little bit and they called him Black Jack instead of the N-word Jack to make it a little bit more, I guess, nice. <laughs> but that's what he was called from that point was Black Jack. So that's where the name comes from. But um, he, sadly though, he did cave into political pressure from Woodrow Wilson and some of the other American generals and he wouldn't let blacks fight with the whites in France. But he did let them fight for foreign powers. And I don't even remember, but um, my friend Jordan talked about that, that you know, that um, that's why some were fighting in French uniforms because the French would let them, oh, there's my brother-in-law talking about with his fishing experience. Anyways, but um, how the, um, um, the blacks for America would fight with other nations like the French. That's why they're wearing French uniforms. So, you know, sadly he did cave into political pressure, but he was doing his best with the times that, you know, he had. Okay, so the Germans, when they saw that America was coming, keep in mind this war has already been going on since 1914. You know, this has been going on for a few years and they see the Americans coming over now in 1917. They're like, time is running out. We can't penetrate the French, bear, um, you know, we can't, the, 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 gosh, I gotta talk right now. The French um, lines. So what happened was they said, we're gonna do something pretty desperate. Now, in World War One, it was a lot of what you call trench warfare. Basically, both sides would dig in these really elaborate deep trenches and hide in those trenches. And between the trenches, there was a big flat area of scorched earth called no man's land. It was called no man's land because no man was there because they'd just be shot to death if they tried to stand there. So it was this big desolate wasteland between the trenches. So the Germans thought, you know what we're going to do is we're going to just run, a, we're going to bomb the crap out of the British and the French and we're going to run as fast as we can and try to take over. And so that was the idea is that, you know, they were going to do it a desperate artillery fire and then they were going to rush across no man's land. But Americans came because the French and the British held off the Germans long enough for the Americans to come and provide reinforcements and the Germans were not able to penetrate through. I should mention a side note is um, red poppies, they're a symbol of soldier sacrifice and on Remembrance Day slash Remembrance Day is, is in memory of World War One and it's in a lot of a lot of nations. We celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th and basically we honor all veterans but red poppies are a sign of that and the reason why is because on the battlefield when you have that no man's land area even though everything is destroyed and ruined red poppies would still grow in the midst of all the bodies and all the destruction. So if you go to the World War One Museum, when you first walk in, you stand on a glass floor and under you see all these poppies, all of them representing the, the men who died in World War I. So, But that's why red poppies are considered the symbol of soldier sacrifice. It's not because of blood and red, it's because the flowers would grow through all the chaos in the middle of the, the fields. Okay, so on May 27th, 1918, the Germans did break through the southern end of the French line. Keep in mind, we talked about in the beginning, right, how the Germans had this idea that they were going to quickly rush in, take over, uh, or take over Paris, turn around and fight the Russians when they came. Well, they were never able to take over Paris. The first is called the Schlieffen Plan. And they were never able to even get through that first part of their plan. So they did finally break through the southern end of the French line, but then the Americans played some really big roles here, and you had two important battles. You had the Battle of Chateau Thierry and the Belleau Wood. It's your two battles where the Americans played a big role in stopping the German offensive. And the Americans decided to take the offensive with the Argonne Offensive, and the Americans charged against, that's a German, against Germany, sorry. The Americans forced the Germans back, and there were 117,000 American casualties and 26,000 Americans died. They were killed in action. But the Argonne events was very was very helpful in deciding the outcome of the war because the Germans pretty much gave up after they were they they failed to break through the French defenses and then after they were pushed back by the Americans the Germans reached a point where they knew they were going to need to surrender. Um, I do want to mention a guy named Alvin York. He's phenomenal. Um, he was a Christian man from Tennessee who had gotten saved in a revival, and he didn't even know if violence was okay. Like he, he was a pacifist pretty much. If you've seen the movie. Hacksaw Ridge, he was kind of like the hero in that movie, but, but he's like, I don't know if I can fight, I don't know if God wants me to, but he spent a lot of time praying and he felt like God gave him the green light, so he went into battle. He was a sharpshooter, he served during this Argonne offensive time, he was in the Argonne forest, and it, we don't have time to go into the full story, but he went and basically he was with a group of Americans, some of them got shot and others had to take cover, but he by himself took 132 German prisoners by himself, he killed 25 Germans and he silenced 35 machine guns. 
It's a pretty big deal for one guy. And so he's a war hero. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor for doing that for obvious reasons. And after the war, he built a Bible college to honor God. He said it's a school for God. So a good Christian guy with a good heart, but he was also deadly on the battlefield, Alvin York. Okay, so the armistice uh, um, was finally to end World War I was signed on November 11th, 1918. That's why Veterans Day is on November 11th. That's why Remembrance Day in other countries is November 11th. It's celebrating the signing of the armistice. <clears throat> now an armistice isn't like we're both sides all say, okay, we all agree now to stop fighting. It means we really don't agree, but we're sick of fighting. So they just basically agree to stop fighting and move on. So an armistice was signed on November 11th, 1918 to end World War I. And what happened in the, in the aftermath of all that, we'll talk about next week, but that's the basics. And I know there's a lot more about World War I. It's, it's, you could spend your whole life studying it, but that's a little bit about how America got involved. Some of, some of the, the way that our economy and our, our society was changed, how some of the specific contributions we made in the war. So this week, here's what I want you guys to do. You watched the lecture, so kudos to you. Um, because it's a four day week, I'm not gonna require you guys to do two replies to classmates, but I do want you to just put a good substantial post in the discussion, that's all you need to do. I have a worksheet, which you'll find on Google Classroom, complete that, and then watch CNN 10 every day and leave one comment. I do wanna make a note of this, everything is due by Friday at 3 p.m. I apologize for changing the times, I'm still finding my footing like you guys are, but Mr. Pruitt recommended this, our new principal, and I'm gonna go with this, so I'm not gonna change it anymore. I'm never, I'm not gonna bend from this. Everything's gonna be due at Friday at 3 p.m. So just get everything done by then. Listen, if you have things going on on Friday, if you're gonna work, for example, or if you know you're gonna have a test in another class, then do my stuff a day before, or do my stuff two days before, but you need to get it done by 3 p.m. on Friday or it's gonna be late. So just plan accordingly and get it done, you'll be fine. Well, you guys have any questions, reach out to me. I hope you have a good week, and I love you guys. Have an awesome week. Rock on.